Greetings. I am Vijay Punusami from the QI Group and I have the honor to chair this 45 minute session on COVID, pandemic, and the force of impact investing. With our four distinguished panelists, uh, two of whom have already made a, an on time uh, a, a arrival. Uh, Maya Winkelstein, who is the CEO of uh, Open Road Alliance in the USA, and uh, Leon To, who is the executive director of Damson Capital in Singapore. Uh, joining us hopefully momentarily will be Gail Christine Gannon, who is managing director of Wave Edge Capital in the USA, and uh, Maria Fernanda. Uh, Levi Speralta, who is the uh, CEO of Impactivo in the USA. Now, from where I'm sitting, uh, COVID has, I would say, accelerated this time for new mindsets to find new solutions for the new normal. Because communities have already moved from having to accept what cannot be changed to having to change what cannot be accepted. Now, corporate leaders, like all leaders for that matter, need to be authentic, credible, and trustworthy because they are defined by their action and inactions and not by their words and promises. They know that they have to be tested and prone to attract more scrutiny, failing which they will be exposed as being disingenuous in a world made much more smaller by the internet and more transparent. Now, impact investments are investments which are made with the intention to generate positive, measurable, social, and environmental impact alongside a financial return. Now, connecting these two points, I would like to ask her, uh, Maya the impact on her personally, having chosen to, in effect, unilaterally raise the bar of compliance and expectations even higher by choosing to publicly embrace impact investment. Maya. Thank you, Vijay, and, and it's great to be here. Um, and thank you for that, that question. Um, you know, in the case of Open Road Alliance, um, we have it lucky because we were actually focused on impact and generating beneficial social returns before we were focused on generating um, financial returns. Um, so for us, um, you know, that, that question of, of sort of raising the bar by adding impact to an investment thesis, for us, it was actually the other way around. Um, it was saying, no, we, we have a 10 year history in generating specific social returns using traditional capital tools, namely grants in most cases. So how do we now adjust the business model and the capital tools of that to begin generating financial terms? For us, the answer, um, given our model and our strategy, which I, I can talk about later, um, is we specialize in short term bridge loans for the impact sector. Um, we're the market leader um, for providing short-term bridge loans around the world to a variety of sectors and geographies, everything from um, uh, microgrids, solar microgrids in uh, East Africa to healthcare companies in Latin America um, to companies here in the United States that are, um, again, specifically focused on serving underserved communities and, and populations. Um, so for us, it's, you know, when we kind of think about that, that change or that step up, 
it really has been about saying, what is missing? What is the market gap? What is needed by the impact entrepreneurs themselves? What are they asking for? Which is, I would venture to say, a little different from, I think, how, um, you know, other impact investors have approached it, which is really more to say, what are investors looking for? What are the returns they're looking for? Or what is the impact that they're looking for? And then let me sort of go out and try and find something that fits us. Our belief is that a much more um, surefire way to have both impact and positive financial returns is to actually lead with market demand rather than investor demand. Um, and that's how we've been built. Excellent. So in a way, you, you were focusing on purpose first and then basically brought in the, the profit element. Absolutely. And and for us, it came very organically. Um, we've always specialized in this moment. Um, I mentioned the, the phrase short-term bridge loans, um, which is certainly the financial way to provide describe it. Um, but in layman's terms, our specialty is coming in to situations where an organization, uh, it's not a matter of if the money is coming, but when. It's the simplest way to put it. Um, and the reality is that happens to organizations that frankly are nonprofits, as well as highly profitable companies. If not when, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And in that scenario, um, you don't actually need to be an MBA to recognize that a loan like product might not only be useful, be impactful, um, be successful, um, but could be structured in a way that again, generates financial returns. Um, one thing I will say is we deliberately do not seek to maximize financial returns, but we absolutely seek to generate them. Thank you very much. Leon, uh, from, from your journey, uh, have you experienced a, a, a different um, approach? Uh, do you uh, experience a, a different uh, way you started impact investment? <laughs> uh, well, I, I found that actually a lot of people in impact investing come from such a, a diversity of experience and, and stories that to, to really bring them into it. And I'm actually really excited to be speaking with you, Vijay and Maya, um, and Maya for, for just coming in on the Open Road Alliance and uh, hearing the kind of work you're doing, how you're structuring it. I mean, my journey coming into this space, you know, has been also fairly unique. When we first started Damson Capital, uh, the goal was always about how do we actually use business models to drive uh, transformative, sustainable change. And I think one of the elements in, in starting it was... <clears throat> was actually realizing that, hey, there's huge amount of gaps, but there was at that time, about eight, nine years ago in Asia, there was a huge disparity of uh, one, the recognition of impact investing, and number two, um, understanding the potential of business models and how it could drive the potentiality of, uh, of the UNSDG impact. So we started off uh, looking at it and saying, okay, well, the, the few other challenges here, number one, there's this huge disparity between what uh, social entrepreneurs are looking for, expecting, and what investors are. So the first thing we did was, as, as Maya rightly said, uh, you know, a lot of people said, okay, well, you know, I want this return. Well, we looked at it and said, well, what, what do we need for the world? And what kind of entrepreneurs do we need for the world? And do we have a mandate to be able to support them through that process? Because we will always be able to find the capital for it. And thankfully today we have a Damson Capital, which invests off the balance sheet and brings a network to support these bottom-up, um, you know, uh, social entrepreneurs in developing their journey and their shifts uh, in, in, in market. And, you know, for example, one of our real um, uh, jet diamonds in the rough that we found almost uh, three years ago was in, you know, hiring youth at risk, marginalized youth, youth with some disability and actually doing last mile delivery packages, even delivering all the packages at zero carbon footprint. And I think it's such a beautiful story, but they started off just as a bicycle shop and then shifting, uh, you know, and moving into this. So I think I think definitely a, a different journey uh, for sure. And um, but very much, very, I love the the view of just saying how do we actually think about the transformation we want, how we do it, and what's the most effective way to bridge those two elements. So slightly different view. 
but uh, same spirit, I think. And from your interactions, Leon, with other impact investors, have you seen that uh, uh, basically variety yeah. of, of, of reasons why yes. uh, your colleagues uh, basically got into impact investing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think there are, um, you know, different, uh, you know, I mean, depending on, on where you're being intrinsically motivated from, right, even if we, we just identify it from measures itself, you know, the IMP framework, you know, has a very impact centric metric approach. But, you know, if you follow like most financial institutions do, especially if they come from big PE funds and, and branch out into impact investing, especially from a SASB perspective uh, and accounting based, you know, measurements, uh, they have very strong bottom line uh, influence from uh, impact metrics or ESG metrics, which have an influence around the potential outcomes and business model. Uh, that it will actually achieve. So I think it's actually uh, shown that there's so many different uh, ways that people are trying to participate in impact investing, where it's coming from. And I don't think it's, it's, it's in any way right or wrong, but I think it's been quite interesting in appreciating how they're um, trying to take impact uh, uh, in a very central focus, but actually from very, very different and interesting motivations itself. And I think that also has driven the way that they also engage with uh, entrepreneurs as well, especially when it comes down to a question of, you know, uh, what are the expectations, both from a measurable, practical, you know, metrics and tangible metrics outcome uh, mm -hmm. and how that is, is captured and why it is captured to even the way that they're uh, talking about financial expectations um, and where those come from. And, and I would say that a lot of my colleagues who I think started from very strong financial grounding um, actually came in with the view of saying, well, what that means is we have a very fixed space that we can go after, which have this impact and this uh, financial outcome. And I don't think it's wrong. And to be fair, they have proven, you know, some really good uh, narratives and cases. But the real question is also, you know, on the, on the wider scope, of the world, you know, what else do we need? Of course, thank you. To, to switch gear, I mean, I, I'll, uh, Gail unfortunately is still not able to to join us, but but she uh, shared with me a few, a few thoughts, and I like to quote one part here, uh, and, and I'll ask you a question on, on that basis. She says that this pandemic casts a harsh light on our fragile systems and infrastructures which has further exacerbated the social and economic inequities, particularly to those in lower resource communities experience. As a follow up, she was here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, have you really seen that the pandemic has in a way sharpened institutional investor focus on impact investing? Maya. Yeah, that's a great, great observation from Gail, and it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think the, I think the general answer in my my view is yes. Um, I, I do think it has sharpened it. Um, we've seen that in a, and we've seen that in a couple of different ways. So again, just you know, our product being focused on essentially the unexpected. Um, to be honest, for the first eight years of our work, our tagline was the world is unpredictable. Um, and that was sort of our tagline because we actually kind of had to convince people who were impact investors of that. Um, and, and I have some, I have some psychologist friends who'd actually explained to me that it's actually a human psychological trait that if you're trying to do good, you psychologically underestimate the likelihood of something going bad. Like, it's just, it's hardwired into us. It's not cultural. It's not, it has no, you know, distinction other than if you're a homo sapien and you're trying to do something good or you have good intentions, you will underestimate the likelihood of something wrong happening. Um, COVID, uh, we don't have to use that tagline anymore. Everybody got a lesson in uncertainty and unpredictability. And it doesn't matter how big you are, how small you are, what your strategy is, what geography you're focused on, what sector you're focused on. This is not a climate finance issue versus a healthcare in emerging markets versus bio life sciences. But like all of these other things that we put around ourselves to 
um, help say, oh, no, 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 that's them, not us, right? COVID erased all of that. So we all have deeply in our bones, in our own lives and work, experienced this unpredictability, this uncertainty, and have had to accept, you know, through the prolonged pandemic, um, you know, when it started, we were all thinking this might be a crisis, which is something acute and time bound. Nope. Um, it, it is a new normal. And I think that that in our bones for us, all of us, even personally, that shift has forced investors to think differently. Um, your risk assessment as part of your due diligence is not a check the box. It's probably the most important part of your due diligence at this point, because you don't know what, but you know something is going to happen in these next 12 months. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. We've lived through the last four, four years, last three years, like there's no way something is not going to happen in the next 12 months mm -hmm. that is going to affect and even past COVID, of course, recent developments in Ukraine, like who knows what's next. Um, so I do think that has changed the way that investors look at it and, and the push to impact investing out of that, um, you know, I, I do think, you know, has in large part come from that. I think the what, you know, many folks in the impact sector writ large, um, regardless of financial returns or the type of capital being used, have been talking about for decades, especially those focused on inequity, inequality, um, economic inequality, wealth inequality, and social justice. We are reaping the what we've sown, right? So much of, of what we've experienced is, is reaping what we've sown. And I think people are getting that. People get that. They get that with climate change, you know, for sure. Um, and we're realizing that if we don't like this, if we don't like the world we're living in, and we don't like the world that scientists are forecasting, mm -hmm. we need to make some, some real changes, not just marketing ones. Absolutely. So, so what's the new tagline now, Maya? So uh, we, we always say we are also keep it, keeping impact on track um, has also been our, our um, tagline for a long time. But, you know, I would say we've also gone through the shift ourselves. Um, and for us, we've actually um, shifted. In, and yes, our, our product, its prime purpose is keeping impact on track. Um, but this is our 10 year anniversary. We're actually about to launch a big 10 year campaign. And as we're looking forward to the next 10 years, um, our commitment is it's actually not enough to keep impact on track anymore. We have to accelerate it. So Thank that's you. where we're going to be headed at Open Road. And happy 10th anniversary. Uh, and Leon, uh, have you seen, what have you seen in terms of the impact of, of the pandemic uh, on, on, on yeah. the trend? I, I absolutely agree, Maya. I think there are, especially here in Southeast Asia, there's a very, um, the, and, and for example, the juxtaposition of, say, Singapore to our neighboring, you know, uh, emerging market, um, you know, uh, countries. And when Singapore is doing really well, we have huge uh, challenges with our neighbors having uh, dealing with, with COVID as well. And I think it's such a stark reminder of the inequalities that we're all dealing with and the challenges it is with much larger countries as compared to Singapore. But more importantly, I think, there are issues around, um, you know, the the element of, of uh, resilience, right? Because we always thought that resilience was within, you know, our bubble, and it's no longer the case, right? And I think that's actually also torn not just a, a element of uncertainty, but also a whole element of of, of um, what it means to be in survival mode and what it means to be working as a community. And I think uh, really going back to those roots have been a great reminder for us here in Southeast Asia. But I, I would tackle a little bit of, of um, what uh, Gail had said. And I would say that, yes, it's it's um, sharpened the image on it. But I would say it's it's still a blunt tool of what people are thinking when the spotlight is on impact investing. And let me be very clear about what that means. It means that a lot of people are saying, yes, impact investing. Yes, we need to factor all these things in. And then suddenly we have, uh, we're off to the races, right? Um, with everybody rushing into it. But I think from us, for us, um, in, in some way and form similar to Maya, we've been thinking about um, how do we not just keep impact on track, but also, you know, what it means to keep impact on track. And I, I really think Maya's on the same page. Uh, sorry for, uh, you know, stealing that. 
But I think it's also the question of what it means to have the depth of impact that is transformative. And I think that uh, it's not just about greenwashing and social washing, but it's also just understanding appropriately where and how do we go deeper to not just say our incomes are increasing, but incomes increasing isn't just, you know, a 10, 20% increase doesn't do squat in a place like Papua New Guinea, right? So we got to be very, very contextualized and nuanced and, and understand the challenges on the ground and then say, this is appropriate impact for the context within this space. And I think that that's really the part where a lot of people who are just shifting their, their view into impact investing have yet to really develop the sh and sharpen the view of the um, professionalism and the limitation around impact investing. So very clearly, one example is this. In early stage education, we have seen DFIs, we have seen a lot of partners uh, and advisors who you know, used to consult for people like, um, you know, the, the DFIT and DFAT, for example, who did go into market-based solutions for education at early uh, childhood. But the cost-benefit of actually having a parent who has to deal with a eight-year-old, nine-year-old, who actually has to pay for food and nutrition and caloric value versus actually dealing with the fact that they have to pay for education, very, very difficult. So there are reasons why venture philanthropy some grant giving needs to happen. We're not saying that impact investing is a silver bullet. We're saying that impact investing will contribute and shift us towards the UN SDGs. And we have to be really, really careful about that. So I think, yes, we're, we're dealing with greenwashing and impact washing to some degree, but I think there's even another layer on top of it. And I don't think we, we all need to, to have the answers, but I think we've got to be very aware as we do those risk metrics, ESG metrics uh, and, and risk registers, for example, that we're just appreciating it so that our LPs, so that the investors, so that our supporters understand the elements of complexity, the elements of, of uh, challenge that impact investing has. And when we can get that, that's when you get really hardened uh, supporters who understand what we're trying to do and are there for the long term, rather than people who are coming in hoping for the magic, you know, the magic, I don't know, the, yeah, promised land, right, and not and being very disappointed with it. So I, I think it, we're, we're ho hopefully we don't disappoint too many people, but we also set the right expectations. Yeah. You, you raise a very good point because beyond, beyond the idea I mentioned earlier, uh, this need because we are into impact investing and, and we are in a way offering something out there, uh, authenticity, credibility, trustworthiness uh, are so important. And, and listening to Leon now, and obviously, I mean, humility is also an important uh, component that you can't overpromise something because it's going to come back and bite you. Uh, and and in that sense, I, I would like to, uh, yeah, because obviously we also, uh, when you talk about greenwashing and social washing, I'm probably thinking also about conscience washing, uh, which comes in, in into this. Uh, but if I were to ask you, is the the ethical basis of impact investing critical to its success. Leon. Could I? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Could I, do you mind I, I, I want to hear my I want to hear I, my no, I, I, I and wanted to build off of your comments as well, Leon, because I, I agree with it. I mean, yes, yes, of course, a, a ethical um, is the basis for, for impact investing. Um, and I, I love that term too, VJ, of, of greenwashing, uh, impact washing and conscious washing, because I, I think there's a lot of that. Um, again, understandably, without judgment, but it, it's still true. And you know, some of what you 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 said, Leon, is is so true. And I think there's a few uncomfortable truths that if we really are committed to this endeavor of making the world a better place for everyone, you know, to put it as as simplistically and tritely as possible. We have to accept. We have to just just live with and um, and some of the truths that I think think are there are the following. One is it's all a, it's a spectrum, and things have to exist along the spectrum. So just like in the traditional for profit only corporate financial markets, right? The whole idea there's a return spectrum. Everything from whatever the current interest rate is, which is like. 0.025% or something, right? All the way up to your test size returns. 
Uh, you've got products across the market. Same thing. I actually think that we, I think it's happening, but it needs to happen faster. The divide between zero returns, i.e. grants, right? Venture philanthropy, government dollars, and all of the tools that we're bringing to bear that generate financial returns, whether they're impact investing or not, that needs to come down. It's all one market. A dollar is a dollar is a dollar. And if you are putting a dollar out, you are investing. And every investment has always had impact. It's just that sometimes those impacts are negative. So part of the switch is just asking the basic question. If you are taking a dollar and making an investment, for whether or not you expect financial return or what those financial returns are, that dollar is going to have an impact. So is that impact positive, neutral, or negative? Do you know? Are you measuring? And what are the consequences if it's on that negative side of the impact balance sheet? So that, that's one question. The spectrum is there. We need to treat it as such. And then on the impact side, um, I, I love the way you sort of talked about intentionality, Leon, and I think this gets to your question of ethical. Yes, of course it matters. Um, when we look at impact, part of our, our impact due diligence um, you know, we do, we're a lender, so we do underwriting, um, but we also do, you know, impact due diligence as well. And one of the things that we look for isn't just metrics, but intentionality, because it does matter why you started the company. Um, and that's why I, I like to describe the nuance here is collateral impact. Right? We all think about the term collateral damage. Well, guess what? There's collateral impact in the world too. And that doesn't count in our view for our proactive strategy. And I'll give you an example, right? um, creating jobs, creating jobs in a low income community. Every business in the world that is successful is creating jobs. So job creation by itself is not a qualified impact metric. Fossil fuel companies create lots and lots of jobs. Ex Companies with exploitative labor practices create lots of jobs. They also might improve incomes or provide wage increases. That is not the impact we're looking for. Um, so intentionality does matter. Collateral impact isn't enough because it doesn't take into account intentionality or unintended consequences. And I think that's the other sharp sort of flank of impact measurement that, that some people are coming around to, which is you can't just measure what you intended to do. You got to measure all the other stuff as well. Uh, because unintended consequences, you know, there, I don't think there are many actors throughout history who yeah. in, have intentionally tried to have negative impacts through their, their investments. It's been unintentional. It's been on the side, it's been where they haven't looking, haven't been looking, um, and I think the you know the really sophisticated end of impact investing, they're looking there as much as they're looking where they are, are trying to have impact as well. Thank you, yeah. and thank you also for bringing up the issue, which is the challenge of actually measuring the impact of, of uh, your investment. Uh, Leon, let, let, let's hear your uh, <laughs> comment first. Oh and, man. And, and, uh, I have Open Man, the floor to, uh, uh, but other participants to throw in any questions or comments they would also like to. Just just remind me never to go after Maya. That was amazing. Those those great points there. Um, I I think uh, very very much in agreement. I think maybe maybe just to to you know round it round what Maya said off. Right. I think the 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 first is you know what is the impact due diligence and what do we look at. For us, we look at uh, intentionality, very, very important. But uh, the other thing we look at and we do ask ourselves is, is the model in a way where we would have an, a drift of mission, right? It's, it's extremely important. Um, and so for us, we, we look at impact potential, but we also look at impact drive. Um, and it's really important because we, we unfortunately for us, because we, we can be equity investors, we tend to have a much longer horizon um, well, rightly or wrongly, or, or you know, or it, as I describe it, we're the stupid investors of impact investing because we, we kind of take a little bit of a longer horizon to it. Um, the the other bit is, um, you know, I think when we look at all these different elements, uh, we're always forced into a dilemma, a lot more than people think, and I think that's really where, you know, when I walk past my analysts and they tell me. 
and, and I all hear them you know, having debates, very spirited debates. Um, you know, I, I shy of a fight, let's say. <laughs> and and they're, they're saying, you know, should we invest in these guys? And they're like, well, by context, by circumstance, it's going to be helping. It will, you know, it will move the needle. Uh, and then the, there's, you know, the argument that oxyplastics, you know, in its process is the reason why it is uh, banned in Europe, for example, still create microplastics to some degree, although not 100% scientifically, you know, as accurate. You know, at what point do we shift the needle and can we shift the needle? Will it shift the needle, you know, in, you know, driving these kind of outcomes, uh, but at the same time, you know, damaging the earth. The last point I would say is this. In Singapore, we have a large number of family offices, investors who are based on our shores. And they invest into companies for a long time into a spread of different uh, elements uh, and diverse you know, industries. But what is interesting is when the forest fires happen from a slash and burn you know, cultivation of small borders in Indonesia, so much so that we have a whole cloud that covers the entire island of Singapore. And then investors say, uh, no, consumers say, or people say, why the heck is this happening? Why? And then they realize, well, these are the companies that were also getting these dividends from. Now, I'm not saying it's because of these companies. All I'm saying is that structurally, we have unfortunately converged towards an economic system where it's allowed these elements to happen. Now, how do we tackle that and really go after that? So that's how I know, very simply, consumers um, know that for everything they're doing, there is an ethical dilemma because it is affecting them. It just happens we're lucky enough that it is affecting us directly, or unfortunately, to the degree uh, for the effects of, of you know, the burning itself. So I, I, I definitely think that this, this uh, we're in the stage in our, our financial you know, uh, career and chapter of the world where it's hard to um, disassemble or, or take away the moral dilemmas uh, or the moral questions from it. No, very, very good point. Can I ask anyone who is actually active in the room, if, if you want to put any question or uh, to uh, to Maya and Leon or, or, or make any comment, just just go to manage my mic and, and uh, click on and, and, and join us. Uh, we've got uh, another 10 minutes uh, to go. And, and by the way, the... Comments are coming through from Maya and Leon. It's going to be a very, very short 10 minutes uh, left. But uh, so in the meantime, I think from what you're saying, both of you, in terms of, in a way, uh, the, this need to demonstrate uh, all the time, and of course it comes from the humidity of what you're doing, uh, to be able to demonstrate uh, the, the 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 actual impact you're having, and demonstrate the 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 not only your, your intentionality but also your authenticity, uh, being able to demonstrate a credible impact uh, allows you to know you are on track, uh, and allows you to allow others to see that you actually mean what you say and you are delivering so i suppose because we do also know that because you have chosen that path you are going to be tested you're going to be challenged you're going to be questioned and therefore it's important for you to be able to demonstrate that you actually are genuine in the sense that you are delivering and every dollar uh, invested by you or through you is actually having an impact and it's not just the impact others are having uh, because as Maya mentioned uh, I suppose the most unethical businesses are also delivering some value somewhere right at huge costs but delivering some value so you have to be able to be able to identify what additional values uh, you, you are delivering and what the least Im negative impact you're you're making in a way uh, I was thinking also, as you demonstrate uh, that, uh, what techniques you use in a way, uh, whether it's, it's kind of a, an elevator pitch uh, uh, demonstration of that. If you like one minute to, to actually share 
to a, a, a potential investor why they should follow your path and and why it is uh, it is it is making a difference maya no no i'll stop with leon first he didn't want to go after maya last time so leon <laughs> oh, 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 just, that just backfired immediately <laughs> um uh okay so um uh, like, like I said, I think the, the elevator pitch is that we, we will always go into a company where it, it is where uh, impact is intrinsic to the business model that, you know, in the delivery and growth of the business model, they'll never be in a position where they're considering trade-offs. And therefore, on the basis of that, this uh, scalability comes from both the, the, the model of growth uh, of the financial outcomes, but most importantly, is actually uh, driving the impact outcomes as well. So the scalability is uh, exactly in, intertwined. Excellent. And, and Maya, would, would you? Sure. So um, you want to add something to Leon's uh, already? Impact yeah, impact. I mean, maybe just, I, just. I bet Maya has a better tagline. I want to, I'm going to, I've been writing down all she's oh, no. done. No, no, I mean, spe speaking to Open Road um, specifically, you know, we do use the impact uh, IMP framework. Um, in terms of our, our impact. And that's, that's helpful because it's, it is, um, you know, one of the standardized frameworks. So people understand it. We don't have to explain it. We're just, this is our who, what, how much, you know, got to go down the list. Um, folks who are familiar with that rubric, and that's really helpful. Um, but, you know, the additionality and the contribution question, um, you know, it is, it is a tough one um, to answer. For our model, um, again, short-term bridge lenders, um, we're not in it for nine years like like Leon is. Um, so we actually do get to see the results very quickly. Um, and that's really helpful for us. Now, our average loan term is loan term is 12 months or less. So we can sort of empirically say in 12 months or less, yep, that Series B came in. Our million dollar loan enabled a $50 million Series B close. Our $500,000 loan enabled a, a you know, $5 million um, long-term debt financing facility to close. You know, so we can look very distinctly, concretely and empirical at what our, um, what our loan was bridging to um, and did that bridge come in and what has the company been able to do because of it? So from the business perspective and our impact on the business, um, you know, it's very clear. We've also been very data-driven since day one. So we have 10 years of data for every single deal we've ever done that says, how much did we put in and how many dollars of follow-on financing did that enable? So I can sit here and very confidently say that for every dollar we lend out, $10 of follow-on financing are kept on track. Um, and that's that's really, really useful um, you know, for us. Um, and I think you know, helpful for, for, certainly for our investors to, and potential investors, you know, to, to really understand um, where their dollars are, are going. Okay, excellent. And, and, and if, if I were to put this to you, and this is something which just came to my mind listening to you now, when, when, because obviously being able to demonstrate uh, very, very clearly the, the positive impact you are able to make uh, is important. It's important to you, it's important to your potential investors, it's important to your investors to also get that confidence that they, they, they put the money uh, where their mouth is, literally, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that is working somehow. But uh, going back to Maya's point, that the dollar you've taken and you, you've invested uh, in, in your uh, way, uh, having the impact you see, is that also because the, each dollar you take uh, down the path of impact investment is also a dollar which you are taking away from potentially uh, negative impactful investments, right? Is that something also which resonates to you? That is not just what you're doing positively, you're also in a way minimizing negative impact of investment in other areas which have a negative social, uh, environmental uh, even conscience impact. Uh, I'll take this one first, Leon, if you don't mind. Um, no, um, I, I'm the mother of two small children. Um, you don't get a treat for not hitting your brother. 
Like that's the baseline. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm sorry, you know. Um, and and I I don't necessarily think that's actually the status quo, the norm in investing, right? Um, I, I mean, the idea of like ESG screens uh, and, and other negative screens, right? Congratulations, you're not hurting the world. Here's a prize. Like that should be our baseline, shouldn't it? Right. Um, so, I, I mean, it, it is true in the grand sense of things, perhaps. Um, but one, I don't think that's how it should be. And two, it also doesn't apply because at present day, hopefully this won't be true in, in 10 or maybe even five years from now. But at present day, those negative impacts are the norm. Right. That's the default. Um, so again, it, it, you don't get points for if the alternative to what you're doing is the status quo, you don't get points for not, I mean, it's just, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, you can't, yeah. No. So you get no point for not having any impact. Uh, get, uh, Maya just froze the, yeah, Maya. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just, yeah, just no. closing out and saying, I, I yeah, I, I think that's, um, I think that's stretching it a bit. Um, again, you, you just, you don't, 100%. you don't get a brownie for not hitting your brother. That's, that's not yeah. how it works. I, okay, I, you I get no that. point for, for basically doing nothing or not having okay. negative impact, but you, you will get points for actually doing something positive. If you're able to demonstrate some positive impact uh, and you can, yes. Leo, I, you know, I, I think my, I just like to say that Mike just speak on my behalf from now on. That was amazing. <laughs> analogy. I, I, I'm going to use that now. Maya. I think the, the, the other bit is that's a new tagline. Speak, speak to Maya. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, oh, no, the, the tagline is channeling Maya really. Um, I, I think, um, the, you know, for a long time, um, impact investing has been going on in some way and form. I think greenwashing is a very uh, good example of why um, we can't just say we're not doing any bad. I think greenwashing was always the improved version of it. And that's why, you know, even in green bonds as a, as an asset class, there are certification elements of why you have to be green enough. And I think that's really important because if you're improving um, the status quo by five to 10%, I mean, yeah, it may sound like a lot, maybe in a large scale operation, but it still doesn't really uh, indicate impact on a transformative level. And I think then there are good reasons why we can't go after greenwashing solutions because it, a greenwashing solution isn't to say you're doing bad, they're just not doing enough. And I think that's the difference between when we say greenwashing versus you know what a lot, a lot of people perceive as greenwashing hiding bad things happening. Yes, it is an element of hiding bad things, but it's also the fact they're just not doing enough to move the needle. And I think we have to really accept that element of what we mean by greenwashing, like impact washing. Excellent. Well, listen, it's been very, very interesting discussing with you. Uh, time flies. Uh, we've got one minute uh, on, on our clock. So as we come to the end of the session, I really wish to thank uh, Maya and, and Leon for your very insightful and, if I dare say, very impactful contributions uh, to, our, to our session. And, and I'd like to close with, with, uh, with a quote from uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr., who very aptly stated that the time is always right to do the right thing. And, and I'd like to add my own little uh, uh, add to this, which is that the time is never right to do the wrong thing. On this, again, thank you very much. Stay safe, all of you, and and keep making a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Leon. Thank you, participants. Thank you. Thank you, you, Leon. It's great to speak with you all. Likewise. Take care. Bye-bye.